First of all, let's talk a little bit about the logic of using the uh, 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and the various other 12-step uh, recovery programs that have grown out of it uh, for use in practicing green meditation, and specifically for use in uh, healing the rift that exists in each one of us between ourselves and the planet. The logic is really pretty inescapable and pretty simple. Nothing can explain why a species would do what we are doing today <coughs> other than an addiction. It's so completely self-destructive, flies so much in the face of the evidence, so much in the face of reason, so much in the face of <coughs> all that we know about ourselves and the planet, not only in our hearts and in our minds, but in our bodies, in our actual selves, down to the soles of our feet. We know that in killing the environment, we are killing ourselves, and yet we persist in doing so. We cannot stop ourselves. It is an addiction, an addiction that's so vast and so big, we can't even see it whole. We don't even quite know what to call it, but it's that profound. If it is an addiction, and we want to find a way to recover from it, not only individually, but as a species, as a group, then there aren't too many ways that effectively treat that. There aren't too many ways of effectively getting over that. A uh, 12-step spirituality, which grew out of uh, uh, the efforts of uh, uh, alcoholics trying their best to, to find uh, a method of recovery in the early part of the last century, uh, was the best anyone had ever done with it. In fact, it was quite revolutionary. There's probably a reason why the 12 steps began with alcoholism rather than with gambling or sexual addiction or overspending or overconsuming or overeating or any of the numerous other kinds of diseases and addictions that people suffer from. It is the oldest recorded addiction. It is really the er addiction, the first addiction, alcoholism. If we look back in the history of various cultures where alcohol was introduced, we find uh, evidence of it everywhere. It's very, very old. There is um, one uh, famous addiction specialist who says that the alcoholic and the other addicts are like the train whistle announcing the arrival of the out-of-control locomotive that is modern life, that is about to jump its tracks, about to crash. So that, in fact, what we find in these uh, brave men and women emerging in the early 30s trying to solve their problem is a group of spiritual pioneers who are, in fact, wrestling with a problem that afflicts us all. These were people who were simply so desperate, who had tried everything and could not heal themselves, no matter what they tried. And it was really a matter of, of, of either get sober or die, for almost all of them. And yet they somehow discovered uh, this way of doing things. Our situation is analogous. Because it, it, this addiction exists at the cultural level, and we are all so wrapped up, up in it, we don't see it as individuals. We don't, it's hard to make actual contact with it. If you look at the first step uh, in the 12 steps, it says, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Well, if you look around, uh, if you look at yourself and you look around at your friends and family and people you know in the culture, there aren't, there are some people who would say, my life is unmanageable. But most people would say, oh, actually, I'm getting along pretty well. My life is pretty manageable. Even people who are in debt, even people who uh, aren't in perfect health, uh, somehow the act of uh, daily consumption, the, somehow the day, daily act of ambition and progress, uh, the various things that drive our lives will convince us that things are, in fact, manageable. It's like the person who's riding a bicycle. 
If you try to balance on a bicycle when it's still, you'll find you can't really do it. You'll fall over. But once you get some forward momentum, it's fairly easy to ride a bicycle. I like this analogy because it doesn't say anything about the direction of the bicycle. <laughs> right? And once you're on it, and you've got some momentum, you can keep riding it for pretty much as long as you want. But who knows if you're going in the right direction. You might be headed over a cliff. That's really the situation we're facing today. In the right about the same time that, uh, that this uh, AA big book was being written, a number of things were happening. One was that the game of Monopoly was uh, becoming popular. Uh, Monopoly was invented by a woman named Elizabeth Magee, and she originally called it the Landlord's Game, and it was an educational tool to promote the single tax theory of somebody, I think it might have been Henry George, or his last name was George. He was an economist, and he had this single tax theory. Anyway, she was a disciple of his, and she created this game. The Landlord's Game consisted of the uh, of the 40 squares, just like the modern-day Monopoly, and it had streets and it had various uh, uh, things on it. Uh, but the first square was called Mother Earth. First square was called Mother Earth, and that's where you took your your money from. That's where you got your sustenance from that, that, that guided you around uh, around the, the wheel of life. And that's really what the game of Monopoly is. It's a mandala. It's a wheel of life, a somewhat demented wheel of life uh, in its modern incarnation, but that's how it originated. Elizabeth Magee couldn't sell this. She went to Parker Brothers. She tried to sell it. George Parker said, no, it's too educational. People will never buy it. People will never play this game, right? So she went home. She made it herself. The game caught on. It became so popular that uh, it quickly outstripped her ability to manufacture the game, and so people started to make it themselves. The idea was, after all, very simple. So people would get a big piece of cardboard, and they would do it, and lo and behold, uh, they couldn't remember what the street names were in the original landlord game, so they simply used the streets in their own town. Finally, uh, in the 30s, an out-of-work uh, cooling engineer uh, I think his name was Charles Darrow, I'm, I'm, don't quote me on that. He saw the Atlantic City version of Monopoly and realized that it hadn't been patented. And so he copied the an Atlantic City version, homemade version of the game, and he added the iconic figures and the little boot and all that sort of stuff, and he patented it. Long about this time, People in the Midwest were saying, well, this really is a pretty good portrait of our, uh, of our economic life, right? Of, of, of the American dream and the desire to get ahead and the constant perpetual motion and all that. But there's no sort of like community aspect of it. So community uh, chess was born. And I think that was somewhere in the Midwest. Somewhere around California, somebody introduced the element of chance. Well, it's, you know, there's, there, you know, there, there's the role of the dice, but there are other elements of chance that come into play in life. Right, that affect your, your health, your monetary future, and all that. So it was a collective project, a lot like the creation of this book was a collective project in the other direction. Okay, This was our collective delusion, our collective addiction, which was being made, a mandala to our great addiction. So by the time the uh, game of Monopoly was patented, uh, it had assumed the form we know it in today. But the first square was no longer Mother Earth, and it was no longer called the, the landlord's game, it was called Monopoly, seizing complete control right, of everything, of all the money, getting all the money, all the life, all the control, all the power, okay, all in one place. Winner takes all. And the first square was no longer Mother Earth, but go, collect $200 as you pass. So there's no point of rest any longer. This was the same year that the first highway motel appeared and the first highway cloverleaf, the point of each of which was exactly the same, perpetual motion without having to stop. You used to be you couldn't get on a highway unless you stopped. All highways, 
involved stop signs, and you waited for a, a way to get into the traffic. The clover leaf suddenly allowed traffic to merge. That was a new concept. So all of this happened in the same year. Go collect two hundred dollars as you pass. The invention of the clover leaf and the invention of the highway motel. Okay, and so suddenly uh, we're driven by speed. Suddenly we're keeping our balance, so to speak. We have the illusion of manageability, but it's only an illusion because we have no idea where we're going any longer. So we have the illusion, we have that balance that comes from speed. If we were to stop for one moment, we would find that it was completely unmanageable. It, it, it cannot hold. There is no balance. It falls over immediately. And so that's really what we're asked to do at the beginning of these 12 steps. We admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. We admitted that our lives were powerless over velocity, over the speed of, mod of modern life, over the momentum of modern life. The second step is came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Now, from our point of view, that power beyond the self, whether we name it God or Vishnu or uh, Allah or uh, serenity or universal truth or life or love or life force or whatever hardly matters because ultimately it's the earth. The earth is the only thing big enough to offer a course correction to a species like global warming is doing now. Major course correction. Global warming is saying you can come this far but you can't come further than this. These are the limits. This is the limit established for your species. If you go beyond that limit, it will destroy you. It's a very simple, very universal teaching being offered to all human beings. Only the planet can offer that big a teaching. So, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. What sanity? Sanity is living in our box, the box we came in. The human species is like a size uh, eight shoe that has become a size 8,000 shoe. <laughs> it no longer fits in its box. Nothing about human life as it's being lived today really fits the niche that we were born into in nature. Uh, nature will guide us in finding that balance again if we accept the correction, if we accept the teachings. Then it says, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God, the planet, the earth, as we understood him. Um, this made a decision is, if we came to believe that a power is greater, a greater, only a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity, then the logical next step is to actually allow ourselves to be restored to sanity. And that means making a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him.